think everybody recognizes what this is. This is our friends 1s, 2s, and 2p. 1s, 2s, and 2p, the atomic configurations for a simple atom. I am going to use this as the template for how I form molecular orbits. Notice that as I take a 1s, a 2s, or a 2p, and I start to combine them, in every case, as I make my molecular orbitals in the middle, I have to make a lower energy and a higher energy version, a lower energy and an anti-bonding version. So there's my 1s's overlapping in the middle to make some kind of bond. There's my 2s's overlapping in the middle to make some kind of bond. And this is a little bit more complicated because I've got these degenerate p orbits here. They've got to overlap too. How many lines am I going to have to draw? Well, I have to draw a number of lines which is equal to the number of bonds being formed, orbitals for bonds being formed. So notice this, there were two 1s's here. They made two in the middle. Two 2s's, two they made two in the middle. Six p's, three and three. I've got to make six in the middle. So I'm going to go ahead and draw those here. And um, we end up with something like this. Now you might be asking questions like, well, how did you know to draw that kind of shape there? How did you know to draw a shape that um, didn't have them all be equal to each other? Three on equal below, three equal above. Or um, why is this two below the one here, or the, 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 the one not below the two up there? And that's actually where the problem with molecular orbital theory starts to come for people trying to do freshman chemistry teaching. The reason that these orbits are put here this way is because somebody cranked out a quantum mechanical solution that said that's what the orbits look like for the particular example we're going to look at. Well, what is that example? Well, I'll show you what it is in a moment. It happens to be for certain kinds of diatomic species, a helium with a helium, a boron with a boron, a nitrogen with a nitrogen. Sadly, though, every time I form a new bond, I've got to make these new energy calculations. I can never predict what they are beforehand. I've got to do the calculation. This means that unlike where I have the ability with VSEPR and VB theory to show you the most complicated of organic molecules, and it doesn't matter what that organic molecule is, I can start burrowing in there and saying, ah, trigonal planar, oh, 120 degrees, oh, sp2 hybridization, oh, there's resonance. I can do that all over the place, no matter what the size of an organic molecule using those bonding theories that start with a V, when I start doing molecular orbital theory, yeah, it's more mathematical. Yes, it can tell us things like whether something is stable or not, and it can explain delocalization. But every time I do it, i got to crank something through using a giant computer program. And so as a useful tool for a person walking around in the lab, you start to wonder whether maybe it isn't worth it unless you're dealing with pretty exotic examples. But it is appropriate that we learn that such things exist and know that that's how theoretical chemists go about doing what they do these days. They still apply quantum mechanics to look at new kinds of molecules and ask pretty substantial questions about them based upon the energetics of what's going on.